In this video, I'm going to introduce you to polygenic risk scores, PRS, also often now called only polygenic scores, PGS, because you can also calculate them on quantitative traits, like for example, brain volumes. All complex common disorders are polygenic. If you want to quantify genetic risk for a complex disorder, you thus have to assess the effects of many genetic variants at the same time. The basis for a PRS is a GWAS, and there's a separate video explaining what that is. For the calculation of PRS, this GWAS is considered the discovery or training dataset. The GWAS effect size are used as the weights when calculating a PRS. To get stable effect size estimates, you need GWAS generated on large samples, as for example conducted by the PGC. But there's one problem. Neighboring variants are correlated, because they get inherited together and thus show similar associations. The SNP density could thus bias the PRS. At any given locus, classical PRS thus only use the variant with the lowest p-value. Correlated SNPs are removed using a method called LD clumping. How many SNPs to use? That's a difficult question. You might only want to use the SNPs that show genome-wide significance, 44 in this study on depression. But what about these ones here? Are they not relevant? Likely, they would get significant if a larger sample size was used for the GWAS. Therefore, typically, p-values of 0.05 or 0.01 are used as thresholds for the calculation of classical PRS. In recent years, many other methods have been published that use Bayesian regression frameworks to model the linkage disequilibrium and thereby calculate LD-corrected weights. These methods like LD-PRET, PRSCS and SBASE-R, they have been benchmarked in a recent manuscript and they perform much better than classical PRS. No matter how you choose your weights, the next step is always the same. For each SNP, you multiply the weight by the number of effect alleles. If A is the effect allele, then the multiplication factor would be 0 in this case, here 1 and here 2. You do this multiplication for each SNP and you sum over all variants to get a single score. A PRS by itself for a single person is just an arbitrary number that cannot be interpreted well. In order to be able to interpret the PRS, you need a large group of people that share the same ancestry and possibly even the same sociodemographic background among each other and with the people used for the training GBAS. And only with this group you are able to interpret the PRS of an individual relative to that group. And if you calculate PRS for many people, you will see that the scores follow a normal distribution. The PRS of a single individual may then map to a lower, an average or a higher percentile within that distribution. Patients suffering from a disorder will on average have higher PRS for that disorder than healthy controls, but only on average. Individual level risk predictions from PRS thus have a very poor sensitivity and specificity. Basically, you can only say anything about the people mapping to the lowest or highest percentiles. They have significantly lower or higher risk for the disorder and for everyone in between you can't say much. You can, however, get fairly good predictions if you contrast the extreme ends of the distribution. But the odds ratios achieved are of course still much lower than for monogenic disorders. Nevertheless, PRS can be used for risk stratification to identify people at high risk that might need more medical attention. In research, PRS have many highly useful applications, from the assessment of the polygenic risk load for common variants in families especially affected by psychiatric disorders, to the genetic characterization of bipolar disorder subtypes, and of course, many, many more. Also many reviews and methods articles on PRS have been published recently and you will easily find a lot of material to keep on reading. 